Uh, I've been thinking a lot about flow. How to find it, how to keep it. Mentally, creatively, physically. Iteration one of any design is usually pretty rough. The first seed to reach germination on this coffee table was the slow erosive effect that a river has on the bank below the surface. I pictured the base stacked and carved, and if you see something concerning, I came to the same point. Pointy is great for pencils and wizard hats, but in furniture, you'll poke your eye out, kid. So I consulted a cooper. Not Bradley, but the craft of barrel making, which uses segments to form a ring. Like the Tower of a Castle, this will serve to protect the point, which is a very important acute detail that prompted this whole commission in the first place. Okay, where was I? Right. Flow. What would it mean to flow through your space? If the things in your space were designed for your movement through the space, instead of navigating around things in your space, what would it feel like? What would it do for the wear of the wooden object? Would the ease of motion result in an ease of mind? I call this friction. Small things that make simply existing with them a point of minor frustration. The rug corner that you trip over because it won't lay flat. Friction. We want less friction. Now this isn't dissimilar to the Taoist philosophy of feng shui, or translated literally, wind water. Wind water. Both fluids. Sounds a little bit like flow. Given my preference for curvilinear design, we might call this elimination of friction, an iteration of feng shui, something more like funk shui, handcrafted and humbly highbrow harmony. All right, flow. Step one, how to find it, how to keep it. In order to ease passage around the coopered pillar, each one of the segments gets a round over. The rounded edges will work double time as a balancing soft yin for the angular table yang and then wrapped around to form the post, giving it an intriguing texture as well. That's cool, but it's nothing if I can't attach it to the tip of the top. In order to mesh the structures, a discus subframe is created and inset into the channels on the back of the coopered staves. Having a circular reference, that's going to come in handy later as well. Framed and half assembled, it's time to fit the pillar to the tip. But wait, how'd we get to the top? Let's do a quick recap. The table is curved because flow, and I like a challenge. So I modeled the couch and matched the convex side of the table to snuggle up with the concave radius of the couch. The case is made in two halves, each laminated with seven layers of bendable material that becomes rigid once formed. The bond is made in the vacuum press. It supplies 13,000 pounds of pressure evenly over the entirety of the surface. No gaps. Once formed, the halves can be veneered. For this, I'm using curly Australian walnut, and for some reason, it smells a little like feet. Make sense so far? Good because now we're well on our way to completing the case. But the two halves must now be joined. Curves are tricky because you begin to lose reference points and for a smooth curve, these cuts have to be precisely where I want them. Luckily, this isn't my first finger in a fun dip and I had made some marks on the bending form at the start so I could find my way home. And that's how you make a curved case. Next, I dressed up the naked edges, because I'm modest like that, by dressing them up with a waterfall of grain pattern. Then I began to cut the sunburst veneer pattern for the top and inside the case.
I know we're going through this part pretty fast, and that's only because three detailed videos precede this one. You can go back and check out the nitty gritty later if you want to hear more. I once veneered, the teardrop shape is brought to its final form using a precision template cut from the final design model on a CNC. It's then refined and finessed by hand. No gaps. Tracks are then cut for the doors. For the doors, I've chosen tambour, like the bread boxes, except sexy. The domino tape guides the shaper origin, a handheld router with fine motor control that's automated through vector outlines of the CAD model. Since the tambour doors can't bear any weight, some internal structure is needed to support the top. The top still has naked edges, so we'll address that before moving on to the base. With the base complete, it's now very important that you meet Dutch. Dutch is a good girl. Aren't you Dutch? I love it when something is so cohesive it blends, but that it also has enough detail that the appreciation doesn't just stop there. That there's more to absorb with time and attention. With that in mind, I took the opportunity to work with the slope of the case that reminded me of a hillside and make the sunrise. That is, a walnut sunrise tambour door. Red box, but sexy. Remember? Then I had to chop up the sunrise into little tiny bits for the tambour. A nerve wracking task is any bit of chip out would mean having to redo a week's worth of work. Now, unlike your mama's bread box, this bad boy ain't NASCAR. It turns both ways. Now, while this is arguably much more interesting, there's a problem, the gaps. On the convex turn around the backside, there were gaps, and on the concave portion, no gaps. And I didn't like that, so I had a decision to make. All gaps or no gaps. Because the width of the saw blade took a little out of the pattern the continuity looked just a little bit wrong on the no gap side. So all gaps, no problem. Just 576 cuts and we're good to go. All gap, no cap. Okay, so right, the top comes to a point and we need to protect the point. In order to do that, we're punctuating the tip of the top with a dot. Let's set the scene a little without giving anything away. I'm 800 hours into a build and we're here at the fit and finish. Any mistake will literally set me back weeks. The problem with fitting a loose round thing to a wedge is that the wedge does exactly what wedges do. It spreads. Now that looks pretty tits, but looks can be deceiving. Before we can address that, tambour door basically terminates in a cave. It doesn't make any sense to have the door come back and close in a section that you can't actually reach into. So the stop for the doors will actually be sort of a dummy section of the tambour nestled back in its little cavern. Let me show you what I mean. So those sections of the coopered ring need to be excavated to accept not only the case, but also make sure that the fitment is really tidy next to the tambour door. Looks can be deceiving. There's no references in sight, so I've got to figure out how to keep this thing still long enough to trace an inlaid top that captures the tip. Everything must be fit and finessed by hand.
Now about that inlaid top, it's gonna be round. So I've got to devise a way to route out a circle on the interior circumference of the coopered pillar. The secret to custom furniture design is difficult to suss out. Do you hate an idea because you don't understand it? Because you haven't given it enough thought or because it's actually crap? This design may have started with a little bit of poo, but I could tell there was something to be unpacked in the idea. If I had listened to my inner critic and my actual accountant, version one probably would have landed in the trash, but I'm a sucker for the journey of something that looks like it's going to be a painful nightmare to solve. I don't know why, but I've learned to jelly with the fact that sadistic puzzles are kind of my jam. Once the veil of wonder has lifted from the hows and whys of woodworking, the craft becomes less about the technical skills and the challenge lies solely in design. More on design in a second. Let's get caught up on the technical side. This schnazzy little crown served two purposes. One was a platform and template for the router. The outer diameter worked to hold the pillar in place and keep it round long enough to get a perfect circle cut into it. As you can see, this worked freaking awesome. It's a whole group of woodworking enthusiasts dedicated to jigs and fixtures. I never used to get it, but that's a pretty slick way to get a tight fit. And man, do I love a good fit. So I noticed when getting the column all clamped together, like my thingamascribe here was no longer lining up with my ringamajig and something was weird there. So I think what was happening is as I was clamping around this, I was sort of deforming the ring. But now that I've got this actual like concentric inlay that needs to happen, I'm going to need to determine exactly where that tip lands. So to span this gap, I've taken vertical off of the end point. I've taken that point there and I've marked the interior for reference. Now, in order to transfer the outline of the tip to the top, it would be really handy to have a center hole in my template, but I forgot to make a mark in the center. Six second tutorial. To find the center of a circle, take two points on the circumference, draw a line perpendicular to the center of that, repeat once for center and once more for precision. And that's the center of a circle. Okay, now it's just trace on the template and use that to test fit and transfer to the real tops. Now that the templates look tidy enough to transfer to the tops, I can go ahead and start making those tops. Now, regular viewers will know that I've talked about this a little before, but my background isn't actually in woodworking or design. I studied physiology and evolutionary biology. That's how the body moves, and the evolutionary part being the study of how environment affects physical characteristics or morphology in living things, and over time how these natural advantages shape populations to be functionally and physically aligned to thrive in their environment. 
What does this have to do with furniture? Well, form and function exist on sort of a cyclical continuum, one infinitely informing the other in search of uh, homeostasis, flow. In biology, physical characteristics, known as a phenotype, aren't solely a product of the genetics that code for those characteristics, or genotype. In other words, genes equal characteristics, almost. See, the cofactor for the actual functional expression of these genes is their interaction with the environment. Stay with me, this is going somewhere, I promise. See, for example, the sex of a sea turtle is determined by the temperature of the egg. Females are formed from the eggs at the center of the nest where it's warm and males toward the outside where it's cooler. Just like those sea turtles, to a cellular degree, our environment matters. That's the knowledge base I've been working from and this eco-physical mindset sets the foundation of my design sense. How does your environment shape your life, your flow? How can we reduce the friction in your interaction with your world around you? It's an interesting contradiction to generate concrete definitions about something so ethereal, plastic, and deeply personal like design. Design is difficult because it's difficult to teach someone how to creatively express themselves. That's probably why there's not much information online to consume in this space, for furniture at least. Personally, I have sort of a roadmap that gets me to the starting line of every design. And despite being self-taught and relatively new to this creative world away from science, it's overwhelming the countless number of people who have requested a video on how to design and how to help with execution. Admittedly, I had some reservations of ever doing any educational content, mostly due to the fear that not enough people would find it interesting, but all of you kept asking. Doubts and risk are a part of every day, especially as a small business owner and particularly as a creative. In timely opposition to this imposter shop for which I find myself working, I found some IRL encouragement last month when the founder of Austin School of Furniture, Austin Waldo, and as well as Philip Morley, invited little old me to present at the Texas Woodworking Festival. I was Seriously humbled by the number of people and response to my live keynotes on topics like organic design as well as bent lamination. It was awesome. There was standing room only and it was great to actually shake some of you guys' hands. Uh, so to those I met there, really enjoyed that. And then I was also invited to teach a week-long course at the Mark Adams School of Woodworking next summer, 2024. 
pretty cool. So I've been trying to formulate this secret sauce in generating organic furniture designs that speak to humans, to flow. Every day has been an attempt at deciphering this ethereal and deeply personal thing of design in such a way that it would speak to everyone and their creative expression without just showing how to make a carbon copy of my aesthetic. Most of what I see in the space is design like me, not design like you. For me, this secret formula starts with the shape of the space. And there's actually a lot more. Now, I've spent the better part of this year meticulously crafting and obsessing over the theory half of the learning curve. My name for an intensive design and project course library that delves deep into the art and business of making standout furniture. I'm truly stoked to announce that enrollment is now officially open for the Design One pilot course. I'd like to think of this as more than just a course. It's an exclusive eight week live cohort based crafted evolution designed to elevate your craftsmanship to inspired levels. With a cheat code that bypasses the steep learning curve of finding your voice in the craft of woodworking. With two personalized one-on-one -on -one virtual sessions, intimate weekly group discussions featuring insights from industry legends, as well as comprehensive video modules, we've got every facet of your learning experience covered. You're gonna be guided through a dynamic framework that chisels out a unique personal style. That's a really hard thing to do. From the spark of your initial idea to effective workflow management right up to the art of storytelling. Because the best heirlooms aren't just objects. They're stories that transcend this material world. Their legacy. So here it is. Your formal invitation. Step outside the ordinary. Break away from the linear and let's bend some rules together. Dive into the learning curve and uncover not just the tangible monetary benefits, but also the absolutely profound intrinsic value that woodworking has to offer. If you're at all interested in learning more, I encourage you to click the link in the description below. That's thelearningcurve.io. And I really cannot wait to show you more of the learning curve. The final step before creating and shipping was to attach the table to the pillar. This I achieved by using a dovetail shaped key that locked everything together. One simple concept of flow. 3,000 miles, a thousand hours, hundreds of iterations later, and I hope you enjoy the acute River Island coffee table. The only parameters given for this commission included a photo of the space, a pre upholstery pink antique couch, and the 20 degree custom detail embellished in all the custom work inside the acute house. The 20 degree point of the comma is punctuated with a dot. Pause, stop. A gentle swooping cutout in the case made for a perfect canvas to present the sunburst tambour pattern that appears like a sunrise peeking out from behind a hillside. The curly sycamore sunburst pattern is a refreshing bright interior in contrast to the rich walnut shell. I'm pleased to have worked out what started as a pretty terrible design, and only through iteration were we able to sort the good from the bad. The wild chatoyancy in the walnut grain gives a stunning iridescence to the case and balances nicely with the clean, linear texture from the gaps in the tambour. Mm -hmm. 
The offset sunburst in the top is a surprising favorite. The asymmetry gives weight and visual leading lines toward the center. Each segment follows the acute guideline with a 22 and a half degree angle and water falls over the edge of the top. The rounded Cooper to ash staves on the dot give a soft textural contrast to the sharp edges of the case. Stainless subtly accents the drawer pull and laid top of the dot and the reinforcements at the bottom of the case. The form perfectly nestles into the concave front of the couch. Facing the patio door, the installment provides uninterrupted passage through the space. Flow. You can roll right into the rest of the series at patreon.com slash Thanks for watching and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.